This is the Amp Hour Podcast, recorded March 30th, 2016, episode 293, Colin Show number four. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm Chris Gamel of Contextual Electronics. It's another call-in show. Another one. I figured out last time that I've just been calling these by number. So we're on number four, not really number four, kind of like four and a half because we had the embedded call-in show and I didn't count that one. I feel like I should just come up with better, we should like like color code them or something, I don't know. Right, okay. <laughs> hey, well, it should be like call a different show category. Blue. Call and show blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should categorize them on our WordPress website, and then people, if they just like the call-in shows, they can just listen to the call-in shows. Oh, no, no, just, there just, is, just there like is a separate for category, for sure. Okay. No, there is, yeah. Right. Um, but it's, uh, and the guest, guest interviews are called out as well as separate yes, things. Yes, they are. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, but no, I just, I don't know, I just, numbering things like that always kind of, I don't know. Right. Yeah, some people do that, you know. EEV Come blog on. number or whatever. <laughs> Stop waffling. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to our callers. Ah, no. Before that, sorry. Uh, I need to announce that I will be... uh, So I mentioned in a previous show that I'll be in Berlin and London. So the Berlin thing is going to be really casual. I still... I've only only heard from one person. I'll be hanging out with him uh, on the 5th. But I'll be there the 5th and the 6th. So people still are there and listening and they want to hang out. I'd love to hang out, grab a beer, whatever. Um, and he then needs more friends, folks. I need more. <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I got talking to uh, the whole London crew and very helpful people. We are going to be, let me look it up here. We will be at. Who's we? We is like Mike Harrison, Sar, uh, and a bunch of other people that haven't been on the show yet. Uh, <laughs> but maybe in the future, who knows? Uh, we will be at. The uh, it's the Yorkshire Grey. <laughs> Never a more British sounding pub name <laughs> yeah, has <exactly>. there been. <laughs> so we'll be there on uh, April nineteenth at six thirty p.m. local time in London. The uh, geez, what is the? I don't think you just look it up, but it's on Theobald's Road. The- Theobald's Road. Um, but so people very... have this thing called the internet now. Right, they exactly, can find exactly. things. Exactly. If you yeah. can't find it, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, like I said, uh, Berlin, f- April fifth and sixth, uh, London, April nineteenth and twentieth. But the, the hangouts on the nineteenth, and then if people are at Hackaday Belgrade or in Belgrade or around Belgrade, would love to hear from you too. So that's all I got on that end. Uh, just needed to get that stuff in there. And uh, if there are any changes, I will definitely be updating my Twitter. That is the only place that I can reliably say that I will be updating. So just keep an eye on that if you're interested. Are That's you done? It. I am. Can we have our callers now? <sighs> yeah. Yes. What? Uh, I need you a f- just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, if we fine. have to, you know. Yeah, fine, Dave. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Dave has all of the prompts, I believe, I emailed to him. Uh, so we have some background information. We usually don't read it, but we have it at yeah, least. Right. No. <laughs> Mostly we... I, so, I like to be surprised. It gives yeah, a more you know, that's, that is genuine nice, actually. answer, you know, right, than a canned right, right. answer. Right, so. I agree with that. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've been evolving how we do this thing, too. And so what I just did, I've been doing, at least for this time, I just sent people a Skype chat invite, and then they can jump on there. So if people are interested in the future, that's all I'm going to basically be doing is send you a Skype chat invite unless you can't make it for some reason. And we do have one of those, so we'll try and get to that as well. Right. And we, uh, we, dumped, we dumped that other service. We did, yeah. Uh, well, no, it still called? exists. You can still call in. It's 929 The Amp Hour. To, or sorry, 929 amp hour if you wanted to call and leave a voicemail. But uh, but ultimately, it wasn't worth it because we just needed to call people direct. So, you ready? Go. Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Uh, Trevor Sutherland from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome, Trevor. How you doing? Hey, Trev. Doing well, doing well. How you guys doing tonight? Good, good. Well, uh, not, not tonight here. Good. Oh, yeah, right. It's morning there. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> so what's what's going on with you? What are you wondering about? 
Yeah, um, so I've kind of been a, uh, a tinkerer for a long time. Started off with Arduinos probably like 2008, 2009, something like that, and kind of worked through a bunch of different things. And I recently got a job in wholesale electricity. Oh, interesting. Dealing with stuff kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been really cool. It's been absolutely fascinating. But um, just a lot of the... Um, some of the principles, like, I can't really mesh what I knew before with what I'm learning now. And, like, one of the big things is this whole idea of, like, reactive voltage. Oh, apparent power, yeah. So could... Before yeah. that, could you could you just walk us through what that actually means to be doing wholesale electricity? Is that like you're at the grid, kind of controlling, turning things on and off, or what? How does that work? Um, well, my actual job is actually I worked with with a uh, consulting company, and we deal with um, primarily most of our clients are uh, larger um, companies, mostly loads, but if we have a few uh, net generators mm-hmm. that are in places in the U.S. where they don't have to buy their power directly from a local utility company, they can actually buy it on the market. Uh huh. Interesting. Right. And so we provide services just trying to help them with um, paperwork, regulatory stuff, forecasting load, anything to make anything to make their lives yeah. easier. Because I can imagine like when summer comes around and the Kentucky heat kicks in and everybody turns on their AC, it's a pretty right. big deal around there, right? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a huge deal everywhere. And even then, like there are, depending on how well you can forecast what the temperature is going to do and what loads are going to do, you can... I mean, there's there's room. Um, there are what are called capacity payments, uh-huh. which are based on f- five certain days throughout the year. There will be a fee that the company will have to pay every day for the next year. Huh. And so potentially by saving by saving these companies money, you know, calling them and saying, hey, you know, this is going to be a big day, it might be worth backing off for an hour or two. You can potentially you know save these folks a lot of money. Gotcha. All right. Well, uh, so you yeah, were asking but, about uh, uh, you were saying about. Uh, uh, generators and stuff like that right um, exactly so, yeah well i mean that that's the other th- the other side of it too i just i can't really get is is what actually changes when they're changing voltage so i have We're to, so out of our field yeah here, i am a little out of my element <laughs> you're, so, you're more in you're more into the power field <laughs> working at uh, abb but uh, uh yeah, yeah but you know that like, was yeah i was at abb and that was grid level but i was doing like the when you <laughs> clamp something onto a line and it was controlled like measuring that uh right. so here's what here's what i know <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I could throw some. I'm, I'm going to word cloud it for you. <laughs> uh, so, inductive and capacitive loads, stuff like that. You're asking about generators. Uh, when you kick another generator in there, right? Usually, right. that puts a lot more inductance on the line. I know that, and then that starts to do that leading lagging thing. That's starting yes. to already get into the gray area. Uh, <laughs> and so, you're asking about basically like the how the voltage changes, or or how the current's flowing, or what, what's what's the question there? Well, I mean, I guess I've, I've kind of got two questions. One was like the, the reactive voltage, and the other one was um, kind of so, okay, so you've got this, this generator in, and it's synced in at, you know, 60 hertz per second with the rest of the grid. Mm-hmm. And so um, when, say, one of our generators, they up their, um, uh, you know, they, they up what they're generating, what mm-hmm. are they, f- what's physically changing in that generator? Ah, well, Ooh. that's interesting. Uh, and you're saying the, the, the frequency is changing or the, the uh, voltage no, the, is changing? No, the frequency is Frequency ha- the frequency has to stay the same. Right. So what changes to change the voltage? I mean, I would th- I would think, based on my small knowledge of generators, that you'd actually just be, like, overdriving the shaft that's internal to the generator, right? So if you look at how generators are built, there it's a rotating shaft with, like, in, uh, magnetic elements in there, and basically that mm-hmm. magnetic uh, movement or, the, you know, the generation of fields in there translates into generate electricity. I may end up, end up editing all of this out, just so we're clear. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. But, but I, I would assume that there, there's some kind of modulation of that, though. That's what I would guess. But Dave? you're talking about putting multiple generators in parallel, effectively, like switching in another oh, yeah, generator yeah. because you know a load's about to come on or you're reacting yeah, yeah. to a load that's come on, so mm-hmm. you're going to get a voltage dip. And therefore, I presume that the... Uh, that the motor is going to that the the existing generators are going to slow down because they can't supply the power, so that's well, bad. So that's when they have to switch in another one in parallel, and they've got to synchronize it to. Yeah, keep... the other thing I the other thing I knew about is just like when you're I, I, <laughs> the thing I knew about like at, at big <laughs> power plants is that they had to spin up the they had to warm up the generators like or basically you know when they were bringing another turbine online basically. Mm. 
Uh, they yeah. had to. They had a long time of you know heating up the steam and getting it ready to go, and then basically bypassing it, then starting it up, and before they kick it into the grid. I knew that. Uh, yeah. Because if you and, just started, and don't the cold they started. dump it into a load before they kick it onto the grid? Like you can't just have right. a generator go in. Yeah, you with can't no go from load, a dead stop. Apparently, right, like right. it's yeah. So, I, I th- but but I mean, I guess like when you start spinning it faster, though, wouldn't that change the frequency of the the current? It would, I believe. <laughs> yeah, <'cause... laughs> but that's why and that's why I thought that they were um, heavily synchronized. I don't believe they spin them faster. No, but then you're again, right, you're right. we we simply don't know. This is a field of power engineering which we're just not familiar with. Trevor, so what I can tell you is that there are going to be some very <laughs> angry people <laughs> in the comment are. section, <laughs> yep, uh, yep. and I cannot wait to hear from them. And you know what? I blame them for not calling in instead. That's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is on right. my list, actually, to go to a power generation facility and actually see how it's done. Yeah, so it's on my more, list huh? of doing a video for that. Yeah. So, and if yeah. not, if I end up in in Aussie land, I'll, I'll make Dave go too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. We'll have to go on a road trip. Yep. Road trip, right? Yep. So, Trevor, I, uh, you win the the uh, well, Chris and Dave are idiots awards. We the should have known this. Stumping question of the day. Yeah, stump the chumps is what as it was called in Car Talk, <laughs> right. I suppose. But that's when they actually answered a question first. So, all right. So, well, anything yeah, about right. resistors or small stuff? <laughs> 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 um. Small stuff. I'm actually. I mean, I'm working through some uh, DSP stuff on my own right now. But that's all. Oh, nice. That's. I'm actually. I'm trying to find a good textbook or something I can teach myself some of the basics. And um, if you have any, what sort of DSP are you using? Um. Yes, we do have actually. Um. The the there's a free book out there, but it's a killer Ooh, book. I like that. Word. Um. DSP. Oh, I let me just type in Google yeah. DSP free. So, while book. Dave does that, I'm gonna actually. So on the theoretical side, there's one called by Oppenheim that's really good, but that's very very theoretical, okay. and it's it's a textbook, so it's gonna be pricey. Um. But but this but, one is free. It's the yeah. Scientist and Engineer's Guide to Digital Signal Processing by Stephen W. Smith. PhD and it's at World Wide Web DSP Guide.com. Yeah. And it's free. You can just download it. It's it's a really good book. We shouldn't uh, confound the two terms too, right? There's digital signal processing, which is kind of what I was talking about there, and I think what Dave's mostly talking about. You're talking about DSPs, the device, right? Digital signal processors. <laughs> no. no, actually, no. what I'm what I'm looking at doing is is um, replicating an experiment from a couple years ago where somebody actually. Um, Injected packets into um, a Z-Wave home automation system. Oh, interesting! And mm. uh, yeah, I thought it was really cool. And the um, there there was one YouTube video of these guys working on this project, and it kind of failed miserably in the video. But they had a good point. You know, they were saying they're in this auditorium with all these cell phones going. You know, the the interference. Who knows what's going on? So the actual hardware was about 75 bucks to buy it and then i've just kind of been working through one one issue at a time trying to get everything to pinned down um had to start actually got my first taste of uh programming chips and straight up nc instead of uh arduino from that and right, right now that i've kind of got that under my belt now it's time to actually understand what i'm doing with the chip right nice. Because there's a lot of stuff involved in DF, uh, DSP, you know, there's uh, FFTs, there's discrete Fourier transforms, there's convolution and all sorts of, you know, weird and wonderful, wacky stuff um, <laughs> that, yeah, um, and it's a highly technical niche field and um, that's why you have to get a specific book on it. Um, so I recommend starting out with that uh, DSP guide dot com um because yeah. it covers stuff fairly well but and it's free like dave said yeah and, and it's free it's <laughs> right, worth a try right, but right. as always um it's people ask this all the time what is the best book you know on whatever and the best book is the it's one that no, <laughs> the best book is the one that, that you understand yeah. everyone learns in a different way so you know some people mm-hmm. the art of electronics is fantastic for others it's like well that didn't tell me what i wanted to know i don't understand it you know right. so another book might cover it differently it words things differently it's just ultimately the same stuff is just presented in a different way that makes it understandable for you so you have to try several yeah. Uh, so one other thing, uh, since uh, Dave was talking there a little bit, I, I was Googling around a little bit, and it came <laughs> flooding back to me uh, <laughs> about the, the voltage stuff. It's about windings, right? So it's how many windings um, you have, okay. basically. So if you have different taps on the windings, I think you can basically pluck out different voltages like that. Again, 
The comment section is going to tell us, and and we'd love to hear that. that. <laughs> We're going to get some hammered. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, we can give them. We can give them your contact info if you're willing. Uh, if you really, if you really want to hear an earful, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm okay with that. No. Well, it's okay. always available in the comments. Yep. Yeah. yeah we'll, uh, we'll get you. Send me your contact info after, especially public stuff like Twitter or whatever, and send it through Skype, and I'll I'll put that in. Cool. Awesome. cool. Hey, thank you much. Thank you Thanks very much, Trevor. Trevor. You guys have a good one. All right. Bye. I'm sorry, but that was so Americans. You guys have a good one. That was great. I love <laughs> and man. I know it's perfect. It was Kentucky like perfect. accents are great, actually. Kentucky, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and you still understand, like deep south, like you can't quite understand. Right. Uh, yeah, Kentucky's yeah. like they always sound very polite. I feel like they're like I just you know it's very polite sounding to me for some reason. Right. Uh, it, yeah. It's kind of similar here in Australia, as we've probably talked about before. Like the the further inland you go, the more you know, the faster people talk like this, you know, <laughs> and and the harder it is for <laughs> to understand them. Right. So. Right. Well, Aussies are a little weird. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Next caller. Here we go. Next. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Todd. I'm up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, United States. He's a youper. Hey, Todd. A youper. What's a youper? <laughs> yeah, hey there. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you and how did you get this number? <laughs> Dave, a youper is someone that lives in the UP or the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So if you've oh, seen Michigan's right. in two parts okay. before. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about the the UP other than youpers and that they speak. Is it a term of <laughs> endearment or is it a... a I think sort so. Sort of a, you know, well, insult. Todd, you tell me. Is that is that a, a, do you, do you prefer being referred to as a youper? Are you? Okay it, it depends on the context. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. It's like you bloody youper. You know, like that. That might be bad. Oh yeah. Well, that's fine. You, you can call me Todd. I, I'll go by any name, but uh, okay. Todd. Todd works. Oh, and by the way, uh, I have to mention, Dave, that uh, I saw one of your mailbags where you had received a postcard from somebody yep. in Sweden. And it was a Michigan postcard, and that was a town maybe half an hour from where I live. And I think, I don't know if you'd received it from uh, from Sweden or maybe it was Germany, but anyway, I, I got a big kick out of that. That was That's pretty, awesome. pretty, pretty and amazing. And I probably pronounced it wrong. So It's it's kind of hard to actually discern between the UP and Sweden in the winter. Uh, it's just like, uh, you know, it's like the ice planet Hoth, effectively, right? <laughs> right. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I live at the Rebel Base. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so you were calling from your lab, actually, right? You were saying that you're in your lab now. Uh, uh, so what was your question, and what, what are you working on? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just calling from my home lab, and uh, I was just calling in to bring to your attention something that caught my eye a few months ago mm -hmm. uh, and maybe of interest to some of your listeners. It's called Surface Wave Transmission Line. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with transmission lines in general, mm -hmm. whether they be you know, electrical or um, like coax, feeding mm -hmm. power from one point to another. Well, uh, this was developed by a fellow named Glenn Elmore. And uh, he's a ham. His call sign is N6GN. And uh, he came across this about 10 years ago. And he would say that it's something that was overlooked in electrical theory for all this time, not really ignored or missed, uh, but overlooked. And what so it is, is, this the, is a uh, single, uh, single, yeah, single wire transmission line. Google's way ahead of correct. you. Correct. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. Dave, we're getting exposed very quickly this this show that like we're just Googling nonstop during yeah, shows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> Todd, our last caller, we had no idea. So there, there is a Wikipedia page, single wire transmission line, which I'm on right now. Okay. Very good. Uh, in fact, Glenn's uh, website may be more useful. You know, I don't always trust Wikipedia for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, I can send you some of this uh, or some of these links that you can include in show notes if that would be easier. Sure. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Basically, you can, you can do a search in YouTube for Glenn Elmore. That's Glenn with two N's, uh, both at the end. And uh, Elmore, that's E-L-M-O-R-E. -E, and antenna and uh, he has his own channel he has like 10 subscribers and three videos but uh nice. it gets the point across he's a pretty busy guy so could you could you and, give us a, a quick synopsis of what it actually is though i mean because you, you know me and sir, dave are not very strong in the in the ways of the the ham yeah hint is an interesting thing which it's not it is not a single wire earth return system 
which right, is that what is uh, when I think a single wire, okay, yeah, it's got to have like an the, Earth uh, return, right? That's like the telegraph, right? That's that yeah, was yeah, single yeah, wire, yeah, telegraph exactly. stuff. And something comes or a, or well, a single wire uh, data transmission, you know, the one wire bus thing. Well, it's mm-hmm. one wire, you know, but it's got to have ground as well, you know. It's not right. just magic, you know, hanging off the right. end of the line, right, right. right? But this is different. Yes, it's, it's essentially its own return line, which is strange. It um, sounds uh, it diff- sounds over like over Unity voodoo. Yeah, kind of first hand <laughs> kind of you know. Right. Trust but verify. Trust but verify. We, <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Be skeptical by all means. Uh, but I've talked to this guy on the phone, and uh, he seems to be on the level to me. In fact, I if I remember right, he mentioned that he was an HP test gear designer. Whoa. Ooh. Huge street cred yeah. there. It just, uh, yeah, right. yeah I'll, I'll just, I'll just drop that fact. Tick, tick, that I was tick, like, tick, tick. You know. Yeah, it just goes up a couple <laughs> levels, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's retired, uh, from what I know, and uh, I'm sure he has some pretty cool test gear in his garage. <laughs> yeah, it's very expensive stuff, but um, yeah, he'd uh, he'd been working on this for, as I say, yeah, maybe about ten years. And uh, the interesting thing about this is the single wire that goes from point A to point B does not radiate. He, huh. he turned the electro um, uh, in magnetic mode, the EM mode, uh-huh. into mm-hmm. M mode. He, he, he says that the electrical compo- component is, and I know this is kind of a, a buzz word too, but it's, um, uh, da, 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 come on, I can't think of it right now. Not transverse. Zero point but, energy. Uh, the other. <laughs> no, 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 no. Dave, oh, just keep throwing out crackpot terms until he remembers it. <laughs> right? No, no, no. This is a. It's, I, I'm, I am waiting for the name Tesla to be dropped. You know, but no, no. Th- this is Maxwell stuff we're talking about here. This is the E field and the M field and the right, right, you know, right. uh, being like, per- uh, perpendicular stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Normally, in an EM or in any wire, your mm-hmm. E field radiates. Well, radially, you know, it comes off at right angles yes. to the wire. Mm-hmm. And your, your M field is circular around the wire. Yep, right-hand right. rule. Now, yep. yes, with his, with his line and the way that it's, it, it's a little strange, uh, but the E field is going with the wire. Hmm. So he's turned that 90 degrees. It's, it's interesting. So, uh, and it, so if if I was going from zero here, then I would if I wanted to do the same thing, I would need to be on the on the it's on the transmission side, like whatever gear I'm using to transmit is ultimately where the where the the magic sauce is happening. Is that the idea? The magic happens at both the transmitter and the receiver. So what you're doing oh, is well, what he does is he has a, an RF transmitter, let's say at 146 megahertz. Okay, uh-huh. and it, this is an, a high pass type of technology, so. Uh, it doesn't pass low frequencies well. Uh, he uses what are called launchers, and in his techniques, he used something called a, a Klopfenstein transformer. Okay. Uh, yeah, I never heard it either, but it's it's <laughs> microwave Zoom, related. Straight out. Yeah. Right. So yes, he has a, a 50 ohm transmitter, which is standard, mm-hmm. and then he feeds it into a launcher, and from the launcher, it's kind of a cone shaped thing. And from the launcher, it goes to like a number 36 wire. Hmm. And then you can go a certain distance. And then on the other end, you have another launcher, which, con- which converts it back to 50 ohms. Then you can use it as, you know, to power a load or an antenna or whatever. Right. So this is not necessarily a, uh, this is more just a demonstration right now. There's no necessarily practical use of this right now other than showing that it can be done. Is that the idea? Well, uh, currently, let's see, what was his progression? He started off using this as his transmission line for an antenna. Just He, he lives in uh, Northern California. Uh, I mm-hmm. guess it's fairly mountainous there. So he wants to talk to his ham yeah. buddies. He has a hard time. Yeah. So he, send, he sent up a balloon with a lightweight antenna and this arrangement up about 400 feet. Huh. And it worked just fine. Interesting. The next step, the next step was to raise it up with a quadcopter. And the reason he used a quadcopter is because the wind would tend to blow the balloon around so you'd lose altitude and everything else. Right. So the quad keep, quadcopter keeps it fairly stationary. What he's working on now, and this is the really interesting part, uh, is powering the quadcopter with this transmission line. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. all of the power is supplied from the ground. Right, right. Via a single conductor. Yeah. On a single conductor. Like 36 gauge. 
So does he have a video on his channel about this? Yes, he has several. Uh, wait. And he's developed wait, this in stages. 36 gauge? Like 36 gauge wire? Yes. Like uh, like uh, that's, really, really thin. That's ridiculously thin. That's that's almost okay. Like so there, in there, the... that's that's the important piece right there, right? That's <laughs> and that's why you can drag it up four hundred feet as well because then the weight doesn't. Okay, I thought it was just like oh, you cut the weight in half, but you're saying that it's you get this super lightweight oh, thing as well. Right. And okay. another interesting part about this uh, particular um, transmission line is unlike coax, as you go up in frequency, you don't get more loss. Huh. So I could see this having a lot of applications in the future as we use the higher and higher frequencies. Yeah. But why what? aren't people already Stick. using it? There's got to be a gotcha. Yeah. I, I still don't understand well, how it works, but there's got to be – like. <laughs> Surely the military, everyone else, everyone would be all over this, right? Why is it so obscure? To me, that means holds, it's not practical. Well, he holds the patents on this technology. Uh, as far as the practicality, I'm not sure. He does have a commercial entity. Uh, it's CorridorSystems.com. Hmm. And he shows a picture of using a couple of these launchers on power lines. And the idea mm -hmm. is to send high-speed data, like broadband data, over the power lines. Now, I know that that's been proposed in the past. The problem is, how do you keep it from radiating? And right, especially for security and stuff like that, right, you're saying? Yeah, and, and losing your signal as you mm -hmm. go down the wire. Oh, right. Yeah, and right. as you radiate. <laughs> right. But yeah. with this, you know, if this is viable, and, I, you know, I, like I say, I found this a couple of months ago. I found it very intriguing. Talked to the guy, you know, seems to know what he's talking about. So I, I hold out some hopes for this. Yeah, that's very interesting. All right. Well, I might have to get a quadcopter and a single wire and <laughs> see right. well, if no, it we works. Should, I mean, we should mention we've talked to other ones about other ones in the past too, though. Like Makani Power is one of the the that uh, it's like the Makani. Makani Power is these. Qu You're not, not talking about Makoni, are you? No, Makani. M A K A N I. Oh, okay. Right. They're these. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, that's what it was, Dave. I forgot. Oh, Marconi. I've been saying it wrong all these years. No, uh, Makani Power got bought by Google, and they're basically like these kites that fly in circles, and they have turbines on them, and basically they transmit power back to the ground. It's an interesting oh, idea. Right. But, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they yep. have tethers as well and yes. stuff. So, yep. yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, Todd, this has been uh, very interesting. I never so would have found noted. something out. Yes, we are going to have to investigate. Yeah. It sounded like a crackpot thing, but I don't think it is. I think it's just a really niche application thing <laughs> that we'll take a look. Well, think about cool. it. You could have a 400-foot portable radio tower at your disposal. <laughs> Great. Thanks, All man. Right. Keep, See ya. Keep that wow and flutter to a minimum, Dave. <laughs> take care. See ya. Okay, so uh, another one where... Man, keep the whale well flutter here. to a minimum. Love it. We should uh, <coughs> we should learn more about electronics, Dave. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Okay. That's what the next. theme of this show is. Yes. Well, hopefully, our next caller can talk about something we actually know about. I think he can. All right, here we go. Excellent. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Sam, and I'm calling from Peoria, Illinois. Hey, Sam. Welcome. Hey, Sam. Oh, yeah. United States, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bunch of Yanks. Oh, right. yeah, Three yeah. Yanks in a row. Three. Hey, whatever. We had that show with, or no, it was the Embedded show when we had nothing but Aussies. So this is right. this is uh, balance. This is bringing balance to the force. So Sam, what's right. going on? What's your question? What's going on with you? Yeah, I, I guess I had um, two questions. Um, one of them is kind of, <clears throat> it's just something I observed recently. I have a, an old uh, multimeter I pulled out of, a, of an old toolkit, and uh, it's a WaveTech. 27 yep. XT. Yep. Anyway, decent, um, yeah, decent old rugged meter, the old Wave 6. Yeah, it, uh, it was, you know, great back when I used it and kind of got put away for a number of years and I pulled it out. Um, you know, I had to change the battery, but it seemed to be yep. working. And then the other day, I, I went to uh, do a battery measurement, you know, very something very straightforward and simple. And instead of giving me kind of like an instantaneous um, readout, it it like it, it it almost like it was charging up. Um, you get this really slow build of the numbers, you know. Oh. Like it didn't. <clears throat> I grabbed another meter, put it on the battery, and it wasn't like a magic battery or anything. You know, it, that gave me the nine volts straight away. But 
But this, uh, so I, were, I you were, were you attributing that to just, I mean, did it actually get to the, the voltage you expected eventually or what, what was the deal there? Not even, no, it never, it never, I wasn't going to wait around. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it seemed to climb up. It was a nine volt battery. Um, uh-huh. and, and, and the other, you know, I measured that with the other uh, meter and, uh, this one just, that sounds just, like capacitive input charging on the ADC uh, front end, um, because like you mm, know, if a maybe. multimeter have, has like a high impedance uh, mode, for example, that that isn't your regular ten meg, then it'll charge up. It'll you know just leaving the input open, it'll actually accumulate charge on the input capacitance. Um, yeah, but, but it, it could have just been. I mean, the other like, question though, I think is it's not th- that. It's how did you weird. did you verify it was working otherwise? Though? I mean, how, how did you actually verify it was working otherwise? Um, well, I could take you know ohm ohm measurements. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, took a capacitance measurement. So okay. I mean, like, and then I switched the probes too, just to make sure okay. that it wasn't like because I've had that happen. So it was only can, the voltage can mode. Can you use a second yeah. meter to actually measure the input impedance of the WaveTech meter and oh, make sure it's yeah. actually ten meg? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, that is my first step. There is yeah. sometimes auto ranging as well yeah. internally. That uh, uh, it, the twenty seven XT is a uh, manual. Meter. Oh, it is. Okay. Yep. Uh, None of this auto range. Yeah, I hear it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, what about the other ranges? I mean, uh, does it does it work on any voltage range or no? Um, it for I, so the thing is now it's working. I, I don't know. <laughs> that, I left that bit out. Yeah. So <laughs> to add to the mystery, it, it's actually working fine now. Um, mm. Sounds like time, a bad contact in your b- banana jack. I'd open it yeah, up. Make like sure that, you yep. make sure you haven't got a cracked solder joint on mm-hmm. on your banana terminal because usually these I can't remember inside the uh, meter mans, but usually the banana plugs are soldered directly to the PCB. And when you plug in the probes too many times, that can weaken the solder joints, and they can actually crack. Yeah, giving you it'd an probably be good to open contact. it too, just to see how how gunky yep. it is in there. If it's got, a, you said it's sitting in an old toolbox, you could have a bunch of gunk in there, right? Yeah, for sure. So I was actually just measuring it now. It doesn't seem to to be. Um, it's it's much less than ten. Oh, okay. So so it isn't even accurate. Right. Okay. Huh, okay. Mm, something's yeah no something's. Yeah. That's one sick puppy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is from, uh, I believe I got it in my first uh, electronics toolkit in 97. Oh, wow. Nice. Well, my, my first thought would be crack opened soul. up, check for crack solder joints on the, on the jacks and go yeah. from there. And you can let us okay. know that in later shows. Yep. So what was the other question? Oh, and then the other question was um, uh, just kind of like um, – I think I even tweeted at you uh, at the Amp Hour. Uh, there was some Kickstarter project that went bad. Um, mm. yeah, I think it raised do. 13 foot. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was just kind of, I was talking to a guy about it and I was talking to him. Well, I do, you know, some hobbyist stuff. And actually, I, I don't do as much as I'd like to be, but. Um, yeah, join the club. Anyway, yeah, he was telling me. So oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he went, you know, like, he went right down into the, uh, oh, yeah, we should do something, you know, or come up with some Kickstarter idea. I don't know. And it just got me thinking, um, I watch a couple other guys on, on, uh, YouTube and they're, you know, building things. <clears throat> and it seems like, like there's this, this, and I don't know, maybe it's just cause I'm getting older, but it seems like recently <laughs> there's like this drive to like ha- turn everything into a product or maybe it's just mm-hmm. kind of the, yep. No, the, that's the, not you. That's, no, yeah, that's, that's real. That's, that's on point. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, I mean, so what, you want to or you don't want to? Well, I ha- I definitely have. You know, I always thought that, that would be the the way forward was to come up with some product or project and turn it, you know, turn that into um either a Kickstarter or uh, some sort of um product idea. But then I started thinking about it and I was kind of wondering like where do you like how do you guys feel about the state of like hobbyist electronics? I mean, it is strong, but at the same time, it seems like there's a... The state of our union is strong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it exactly. has never been better. I mean, it, there's just so many people doing it, which is also a problem, as we're seeing with all these failed Kickstarter ideas. And everyone wants to be an entrepreneur and 
you know, which, which is great, right? But, <laughs> you know, they yeah, and so just, so, yeah. you know, all these crackpot ideas and, and people who don't know how to actually produce things. They're, you know, they think, oh, they can just start a Kickstarter and then pay someone to do it. And, well, you know, your odds of failing are, you know, 90% or something if that's the way you, you know, think it's going to work. Right. Um, but no, there's been no shot. There's no better time to do it. No more. Uh, there's been no. Uh, there's been. You know, there's just so many resources available these days. Be that you know parts, components, modules, libraries, um, PCBs that are dirt cheap. You know, practically free, and like everything else, it's just. There has been no better time to be a hobbyist. In my opinion, anyway, I would say as well that um, the there's a big difference though between making one of something, making ten of something, make a hundred of something, make it a thousand of something, and right. understanding if people actually want to buy any of them in the first place. And so the first step is always sell ten of them. You know, like that is that's hmm. the step that a lot of people skip. I think, unfortunately, yeah. and um, I think that uh, you're, a lot I mean, of people of, yeah. don't have a feel for the market. They, or marketing they in general, no, I mean, to be honest. No experience, so, I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that's actually kind of where I was where I was kind of going. Um, should, you know, like, not should, that's not the right word, but, like, is it worthwhile to, to think that way? Um, or, you know, marketing, um, coming think up with a business way. idea. Oh, in, in terms of more business uh, mindset than, than a... Um, hard technical sort of there's um, nothing inherently wrong with it no in fact it's a good thing you know you think okay this is a business i have to make a profit you know i have to do things professionally i have commitments to customers blah 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 they're all mm -hmm. good things um you know I, w I would rather somebody do that than some hobbyist go oh yeah i'll just throw this up on kickstarter but i have no idea right. how to do it and no commitment to you know people who buy these things and you know not treating it as as a business as such and then they don't follow through and they just go oh I couldn't be bothered you know right right i think that there's a i think that there you know a lot of people will say oh i just want to just do the technical stuff but man like you're going to end up just that that's the the thing i tell people is like if you want to start a business with a friend doing electronics get ready to possibly lose your friend <laughs> start hating electronics and not actually work <laughs> right. on electronics. You know, like there, yeah, like right. there is right. that that totally that possibility, and it sucks. But if you really, so like you have to really believe in the thing that you're solving, even though you're solving hmm. that problem with electronics. I don't, I don't want to like scare anyone off, but like that, like if if you're if you're actually like Dave saying, if you're making a business, there's a there's a really good book out there called Scale that my friend Michael told me about, and uh, I really like it because it talks about you know, transforming something like a hobby project into a business because there is that transition. And the thing mm -hmm. that I balk at it with it is like, it talks about these different stages of business. And at the end, you're supposed to be able to walk away from it. Like you should be able to walk away from any business, like business you make, not necessarily right. like, you know, like what me and Dave do is more like lifestyle business, not necessarily like a business. Oh yeah. If, like I can't walk away from my business. I, I right. am the business. You right. Know? <laughs> So, and that's a, that's a totally different thing. But if you want to make a business, if you want to make a living from it, you pretty much have to make a business. So I, I recommend that book just as a read through. You don't have to do anything in it. It's just really, it's a good book. <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, I'll check that out for sure. Um, like, so on that, on that same vein of like <clears throat> doing something as a business versus sort of just making something technical, technically cool or whatever. Um, you can do both. Yeah, you can. Yeah, that, I guess that's like. So is that a matter of of finding that product? Um, I think what it comes down to is you're probably thinking about what you think is technically interesting. Dave, what Dave's saying is that there are technically interesting solutions out there that the world actually needs. If you're thinking though, like I want to do this cool thing, then go do that and do that on your own and do it for yourself and whatever, and then try and sell it on Tindy, like ten of them on Tindy, and that that'll tell you a lot about whether people actually want to buy it or not. But that's a that's mm. different than what that world actually needs, and it's still it's still technically interesting. If that makes any sense at all, yeah, definitely, yeah, cool. Well, hopefully, we answered some of your questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a big no, thing. No, it's, it's a big it's step. Just, I can't get away I from the you get point that you should, you know, like really enjoy and want the thing that you're 
doing for yourself, you know, rather than think, oh, yeah, this will sell a million, but you have no interest in it. You're just doing it purely because you think it might sell. I mean, you know, and, and you don't actually like it yourself or you wouldn't use it yourself. I think that's a bit, you know, sure. yeah. it's a bit too far out there. I wouldn't, you can make that work, but, you know, um, the better campaigns in terms of the Kickstarter are the ones who are passionate about what they're doing I rather than just, I'm just doing this for, you know, yeah. doing this to make a buck. Mm-hmm. So it really helps, you know. Cool. Well, thanks for calling in, Sam. Yeah. Thanks guys. Uh, it's great listening to you. So <laughs> it's great talking to you. Talk thanks, to you soon. Man. See ya. Cool. Yep. Bye. Ah, Kickstarters. Yeah. Just, just, just see that air in th- uh, What is it? The, no, the, what's the snorkel one? Oh, my God, yeah. Oh, God. I feel like there's almost like there's a level of like BS on Kickstarter where it's like, if you bought into this, you deserve to lose your money. Yeah, I know. It. It's like, like, <laughs> oh, but, you know, I know. Yeah, you can't actually say it, that, it's though. It's easier, like, for, easy for technical yeah. people like us to, you know, with some technical bent to, you know, do it. But other people see that and, they've, and they have, you know, well, I... I I was going to say they have no choice but to trust, which is bullshit because you can just Google it. You know, you go, oh, this sounds amazing. Why hasn't mm-hmm. somebody done this? Well, Google right, it. Right, right, right. Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. just, yeah. you know, put the word, put the product name in there and just look at the first 10 hits and, and, and put issues or, or scam or, you know, or something afterwards in Google and just, you know, to see what people are saying about it. Um, uh-huh. So, yeah, it's, uh, but still, you can understand how they can get duped from a, flashy video on an idea like that and i think the designer should be made to go right swim underwater 30 minutes go yeah and that's exactly what i was (laughs) looking at (laughs) make it work or die you know exactly (laughs) right you just hold their head Uh, underwater no that's (laughs) all right next caller here we go Uh. what's your name where are you calling from hey it's me osenio calling from uh stafford virginia Ah, I repeat caller. I like this. We're getting, ah. we're getting, we're getting callbacks, Dave. So uh. I think that we're going to hear about some of our terrible advice. And uh, yeah. So Arsenio, what <laughs> it did... ruined uh, my life. I what called did we up t- last time and my, <laughs> my wife left me. And right. how, how'd we do? How'd we do? <laughs> okay. One, it was a little bit of library wonkiness in the end, but it also was a little bit of capacitance uh, with those long lines with the shortened lines of the new compact version that Chris probably saw already. Oh, wait. We have to rec- a remind us of what, all, what show you're on. Yeah, yep. sorry. Uh, I was on number t- the first call-in show about the rocket stabilization mm. system with uh, rockets, I2C right. IMU. Gotcha. Yep. Oh, yes, and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, it, it, it was was the capacitance? Uh, it was, yeah. It pro- was the capacitance and a little bit of oddity with the library and the FIFO, the way it was written, but I mm. fixed that. Now... My other question so I, is... I, th- I think I was right. Sorry, I think I was right there. Yes. Wasn't I? I, I said it was the yeah. user lower value pull-up resistor to see if it goes away yep. and then look at the symptoms. Yes, I called it. Yes. Yes. Dave likes nothing better than, <laughs> than e- easily distributed <laughs> advice. <laughs> Dave, I took your advice. I bought my oscilloscope, the Weigel 1054Z. Excellent. Nice. Good man. It's a beauty. It's a Bobby Dazzler, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> For the All money, right. anyway. So my question yeah. is about spiders in your workshops. Have yeah. you seen the video of my spider in the w- old workshop? No. Oh, <laughs> you'll have to link that in. When, when I was yeah. in, when I had my home I remember lab, that. when yep. I was shooting videos in there, I we just, like it was the EV log mascot was this giant spider the size, the size of, of a my hand, softball. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the ones we'll, I we'll, have, we'll have a to link bit in the smaller. video. Okay. Yeah, but they keep crawling across my feet. And just the other day, I was soldering, and one of them crawled across my feet, got solder on my face. I don't recommend oh, that. Oh, no. Yep. 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 Uh So my suggestion, because I deal with this as well, is uh, there's ortho home defense, which is actually indoor-outdoor. I thought it wouldn't be safe indoors, but if you look on some of those things, you can just spray indoors. And basically, I got rid of all the bugs in my in my basement. And, uh, you know, Dude, awesome. I wouldn't be spraying that shit indoors. I don't spray a lot of it. I spray it once a year. I mean, it's not like I'm like huff, huffing this stuff, right? Hosing so. it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, or you just spray it on the floor. I don't know. Like ventilate. You should lab should be ventilated anyways, right? So, yeah, mm. if you're soldering. Oh, and Chris is gonna kick out get a kick out of this. I bought my first PCBs from Oshpark today. Hey, congratulations! That is a great feeling when you'll get that back. 
So good, good for you, and that's going to be great when you get it back. I heard uh, just the other day. Um, I didn't know about this product. Apparently, they're as common as mud. Um, it, it, not spiders, but you can get ultrasonic cockroach repellers huh. that you plug into your PowerPoint I have or something, and it sensors. pumps out ultrasound or something, and hmm. and it gets rid of cockroaches or something. I don't know. I don't know if it's BS or not. I haven't but, seen uh, cockroaches. Mm. <laughs> well, we should call up uh, Greg and uh, Tim from Backyard Brains. I bet those guys would know. Which was a former show, if anyone that. doesn't remember. Right. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. All right, Arsenio, thanks for calling in, man. Good luck with the spiders. <laughs> All right, no problem. Great talking to you guys. Again. See you, mate. Bye. Have we got time for one more? I think we have actually maybe two more. Let's see. Oh, people are punning in the, uh, the little chat box here. Right, the right. Callers who are they're all punning. Yes. You seem to have a high reluctance. <laughs> I don't know if I have the capacitance for this. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. the electronics pun hour. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Chris Kessler. I'm calling from Greenville, South Carolina. Hey, Chris. Welcome. Hey, Chris. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. No problem. No what's going on? What's your question? So, I've got a, um, I'm working on a Pretty simple controller board for a, it's for an RC boat, but I'm using a AT Tiny 84 to read you know standard hobby RC receiver signals, and then using two uh, daisy chained Power Logic 8 bit shift registers to control the 14 outputs. Three of them are mechanical relays, four of them are solid state relays, and then the other seven are LEDs for status and whatnot. So mm-hmm. everything's battery powered and it's regulated to five volts on board this board and that also goes then to back power the receiver so in the last revision of this i replaced the linear voltage regular with a dc dc power converter it was, mm-hmm. a, it was an off the shelf uh part that i found online like a module? I, I, yeah because i tried to build one and, and i don't know enough about electronics to build one myself yeah no it's easy just to build a d de- buy one yep yeah right and mm-hmm. the part cost was cheaper to buy one anyway so <laughs> right, reinvent yeah. the wheel. <laughs> exactly. And then I also added some P channel MOSFETs for reverse voltage protection and then a pull up on the enable line for the 595s, which are active okay. low, just to get positive control because I don't want the stuff that the outputs are controlling to go hot when I when I start up the circuit. So anyways, oh, good good thinking. Yep. <laughs> well, that that was that was the that was the plan, but af- after I made all these changes, when I power on the board maybe one in every four or five times, one of the 595s will just spontaneously burn up, like burn a hole through the top of it, burn up, you know? That's SCR latch up. That's uh, SCR latch up phenomenon. No doubt. What is, no doubt. If your logic chip is just, it just blows up um, and the magic smoke escapes, it's SCR latch up. Okay, Guarantee you. So have, what that means what is that. Fix that. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I, well, I've, 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 I have well, done a video extra. on this. Sorry, Chris. It, it means, uh, yeah. <laughs> just, well, just press four on your phone now, and that'll send a payment to Dave. <laughs> right, and then the we... <laughs> what it means is that one of the inputs has gone above the rail, or or the inputs are powering up before the rail has time to power up. That's what I was going to actually so say. So if, yeah. if you've got a DC to DC converter, it may be taking some time to start up, and the inputs to your chip are already high, that can cause SCR latch-up. And, um, so, uh, yeah. Chris, can you walk us through the sequencing as well? So you have this, uh, you have this, you have a battery and then a switcher, and then basically a 5 volts out of the switcher. Correct. That goes to everything you're saying, right? Uh, correct, yes. Well, yeah, it, it effectively okay. goes to everything. The, the, the relays, the solid-state relays are getting switched straight battery voltage, but that's kind of a yeah. side circuit right. on the board. So what you what you could do is you could enable, you know, with a, you know an N-channel MOSFET or something, you could basically hold the N-channel MOSFET input weak low, basically like put a, you know, 10K pull down on the, on mm-hmm. the gate there, put the power from the switcher directly to the micro, make sure the micro's up first, and then have the micro turn on the power to the rest of the circuit. That should help I, I don't know if that'll okay. do all of your sequencing problems but if your micro is in control then it should be able to sequence things as needed right okay so you don't have anything like that now right no i don't <laughs> okay. no i don't so I power, power was... sequencing is a really big issue right and 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 you often see this with like fpga circuits where you have to like sometimes even ramp them at the same rate and all this crazy stuff have you scoped the have you looked at your how, how it actually starts up 
No, and scope. that's actually that's I don't have a scope, and that's that I figured it was uh, something yeah, to do with the power a, yeah. startup because as soon as mm-hmm. I added the this yep. module, it started happening, and it's it's fine with the the yep. linear voltage regulator, but that's I was, I'm trying to get a little bit more current capacity out of it to run um, the receiver, and the there should be another server or two on the receiver that are actually going to draw some current. So, right. so I, had, I don't know anything about power startup or, or anything right. like that, and I figured there was something crazy that I was doing just out of ignorance well basically is it is it a 74 hc 595 that's actually blowing up uh no it's it's a stp ic 6d 595 it's a high power version to get enough oh. uh current cap- cap- capability on each of the channels for okay. the um for the mechanical relays that i'm switching gotcha Interesting. okay uh, what to, about yeah so one of the other things i would say is that if you if you if you're buying like a cheap power module Mm-hmm. Not not to say that you're being cheap, uh, but oh, what I you am. could have I is am. if it's <laughs> if it's not properly if it's not properly in regulation. So if if it is actually so when you see it, if you see an in control DC to DC power module, you should see a nice smooth ramp, you know, from whatever the input is up to five volts, right? So sure. what, and what is the input? What are the batteries? And slow ramp in too. Slow ramp in can also yeah. cause SCR latch up mm. in various devices. So you have got to be careful. Right. So okay. what is the battery? Yeah. The batteries right now, I'm trying to get it to work on anything from basically uh, 6.6 or, or two life, you know, two lithium to mm-hmm. to four, so 13 ish. So anything in that range is kind of the okay. Goal. But it's it's only doing a it's only a buck, so it's not doing buck boost or or boost or anything right. like that on the right. switching controller. It's never going below five volts on the input. Correct. Okay. All right. So, so uh, yeah, I think you know, Dave. This actually might be an interesting. <laughs> we could we could do the uh, the oscilloscope test for a lot of these uh, issues. Uh, so, Chris, why don't you have an oscilloscope? Since we just talked to Arsenio and he just was super pleased with his purchase. Uh, because I haven't had the intestinal fortitude to to put out the four hundred dollars or whatever to get one yet. Uh, I see. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, I understand that's, that. That's basically uh, what it is. I had I've ha- right. I have a logic analyzer, and that's that's been able to solve the overwhelming majority of my problems up to this point and, and this is i guess the first real thing i've run into that yeah. a, that an oscilloscope would maybe help better with absolutely so. how many dollars of parts have you blown up so far <laughs> uh 150 probably 100 no Some really full, a lot oh yeah oh yeah Whoa. wow the, the board, wow. Oh, the okay board, man yeah that's the, wow. the board with everything on it's about 60 it, it, it's about 60 bucks yeah it's, it's i mean time. You, you don't have to spend 400 bucks to get right. a scope, I That's mean, you true. can buy yeah. what you know a bloody hand tech or you know one of those yeah the really USB crappers cheapy ones. They're yeah. like two hundred and fifty or something. But or if you're you going to spend two fifty, just spend four hundred. I'm sorry, I just I yeah, I've stopped I, suggesting lower than that. I know it's I know it's it's not a small amount of money. I know that. Uh, but no, man, no, and, it'll, and I'm, I don't have a problem yeah. getting getting decent tools. It's yeah. but you know it's it's. There is a line that's any tool under a hundred dollars. Like, okay, sure, fine, whatever. But if it's over that, it's kind of like, well, this is, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, no, card on this. Yeah. Do I really need it? Yada yada yada. Yep. But that's well. Anyway, actually, that's, that's our... useful. Yeah, I would love to hear about the the resolution of this. To be honest, what yeah. it actually is. Yep. So okay, so, uh, yeah, I'll definitely, I'd love to uh, be able to sit there and actually play with it or something, and let you know yep. if I can get it solved. Okay, yes, great. please. All right, appreciate the help, Chris. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Bye. Yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting test over time, I think. Because yep. it, it it's a big, I mean, it's a big deal, right? I mean, you get scopes sent to you every week. It's not a big deal for you, but you, you remember what it was like your first scope. I, right? You've exactly. talked about your pocket money yeah, scope, yeah. right? And yeah. It, uh, well, it was eight hundred bucks. I've done a video. That's on true. This, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right? The average the <laughs> eight hundred bucks in some distant time ago that was worth even more it, now, right? What, what's that in today's dollars? It, it, it wasn't until about two thousand and nine, about no, two thousand eight, two thousand and nine. When yeah. Rigol actually cut the price, no, yeah, it was it was two thousand and nine. They cut the price of the ten fifty two e from eight hundred bucks to four hundred bucks, and it was like holy crap! Yeah, right. You right. can actually get a scope for four hundred bucks for the last, you know, for ever since I was born. Right, scopes have always, you know, a half decent twenty meg dual channel scope was like eight hundred bucks. That was the entry level price to get you a reasonable, you know, a decent scope. Yep. And and back then, eight hundred bucks was worth a hell of a lot more than it is now, right? Right, right exactly. But now, yeah, exactly now right. you can get with yeah. someone for for half that. Yep. You know, a really kick-ass one for half that. 
and well, you know, Thank and you, it's Moore's not Law. worth as much. I know. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. But we that, should mention, yeah. actually, speaking yeah, of Moore, even though it's not Moore, uh, Andy Grove passed away. And that actually, did? that guy, man, that guy was pretty awesome. Yeah. I'm sure that everybody read about that in the news, but you have, and go read about Andy Grove. That guy yep. was uh, groundbreaking. And now they say in Moore's Law, Intel has accepted that Moore's Law is dead. That's also true. Yeah, that was crazy. So Yeah. That's we will talk like, about that I, in future weeks, I'm sure. Yeah, We have to do it. There, there's a T-shirt in that. Moore's Law. <laughs> Moore's Law is dead. Long or live Moore's I, Law. Or, or Moore's Law, I still believe. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yep. Got to do it. I might have to create a shirt. I think that's good. Right. That'll, that'll be yep. a good one. Yep. All right. Here we go. Last caller. Last caller. Make it quick. Oh, yeah. You're so busy. Oh, I'm so busy, dude. You <laughs> don't know so what the busy. date is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, uh, William calling from California. And, uh, Welcome, I've William. Actually, uh, what's going on? Uh, hey, Will. Oh, good. I met you, Chris, at a couple times. The last time was in uh, Oregon at the Mini Maker Fair that, at the bar, that meetup we did. Ah, yes, at the bar. Usually at the bar is not uh, a yeah. <laughs> good way for me he to remember no things. no recollection because yeah. it was at the bar. <laughs> you sure it was me? No, it's, uh, it's good. Yeah. well, good. I'm glad you called in. So what's going on? So um, I don't know if you remember, I had my USB tester that does um, monitors, makes it easy to monitor uh, current and, and voltage. And mm-hmm. I'm looking to make a new version of it. And uh, currently it doesn't do microamps very well. So that's what I'm looking to get into. Um, I've tried mm-hmm. to... Couple oh, things. he's a competitor, Dave. He's a competitor. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, um, but, have you looked at, like, there's many of these now, these USB power devices. I've got a real funky one um, that, well, you know, does graphs and everything. It's got a little LCD in it. And yeah, why kind of are you reinventing the wheel here? Well, they're, all those Chinese ones are kind of crappy. I don't know which one you have. Um, well, mine started a few years ago with a... Um, just to break out USB to use your own multimeter, and then it kind of grew right. with a backpack with an OLED data logging. Yeah, yep, and that's how of... these projects always go. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> I just started out think... doing this, and then <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And I, I tend to try to throw everything I can at it. So, but currently I'm using this TI chip, this INA two one nine that kind of does everything for you on the analog side. So, mm-hmm. yep. but. To do microamps, it sucks, and then you go to there's a one that's an IN, uh, INA one six nine that does an analog output, but then I'm you know in the analog domain, which is out of my comfort zone, and um, I'm using an STM, and it's just not getting the same results that the uh, digital version was over I two C. So now I'm like, well, should I just design a whole an old you know, a whole analog front end, or you know go all well, out? Well, the problem you've got here trying to measure microamps up to what an amp or half an amp, the 500 milliamp USB limit. Well, going yeah, up right. and going up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I was thinking that you could have one channel that's that goes microamps to milliamps. So, like, if you have a microcontroller that goes to sleep and wakes up, you want to catch that. That type of thing. Right. But then it becomes a dynamic range yep. issue. And just you've ranging got, in general, yeah, right? I mean, just you, ranging. Yeah, it's ranging and dynamic range. So either you've got to decide to go with just one current shunt resistor, right, a low value, and then gain the crap out of it, mm-hmm. right, to get down to the micro, to measure the Which is the, how the uh, microcurrent microamps. works, and that actually is the right... Tr- well, yeah, the yeah, microcurrent yeah. Current has three different ranges. You've got to manually right, right, switch right. them, and that's a, that's one of the complaints. But, like, right. or, yeah, and then you've got to use a massive dynamic range, like a 24-bit ADC, to get the dynamic range that scales. There's a bunch of noise. That allows you to measure from 500 milliamps down to, you know, 0.5 microamps or something. You right. know, or yeah, right. you've got to range right switch now, it. I'm able to do uh, all the way from about a milliamp all the way to about three amps. Right. So, yep. So what I will yep. tell you is that these the parts that you're using the INA two one nine and the one six nine that you're looking at anything with current shunt in the name basically is not meant for low low current stuff. Basically, it's it's meant for power monitoring and it's not I, as far as I can tell. I mean, I've looked at them a lot just from my old days of measurement stuff. And if you want to get, you're going to have to do that. If you want to get a good signal and a good analog output, you need to basically build it like Dave did. I mean, you, you can you can do digital switching. The thing that Dave didn't do is he didn't put like you know analog switches in there, but that's a cost trade off as well. And I I think well, that's well, it's also a performance trade off uh, when you're trying to switch. That's uh, true. Yeah, you know, it it matters when you're trying to eliminate burden voltage. It matters. 
you know, having these analog switches in there and tr- and to try and do it dynamically. Oh, you're just saying for the, low, the low resistance you're saying? You're saying? Yep. Yeah, and, and to try and switch ranges dynamically when you're, for, you use the example, you're trying to, when your processor goes to sleep, you want to, you want right. your circuit to switch ranges so then it can, you know, suddenly provide, um, you know, greater measurement capability down in the microamps range, then that's going to upset your circuit from a burn-in voltage right. point of view as well. You know, it's like, it's a... And I've, <laughs> I've seen a lot of these circuits before, and uh, the way it's to do fun, it is with yeah. relays. Like Dave's saying, Dave does yeah, it with yeah. a physical switch. You can do it with relays, yep. which is super slow, or yep. you can do it with uh, N-channel MOSFETs, and then it, or a combination of all three, and it gets super messy in every single case. And, uh, yep. And there's a reason <laughs> you pay for that stuff. It's a horrible problem. Yeah, yeah, it's a horrible problem. Especially when you're trying to design a, a generic measurement device like this that has to, you know, like people always complain about the microcurrent. Oh, I want to measure 5 milliamps and my, my circuit goes from 5 milliamps to 5 microamps. And I'm going, oh, dull. The microamp has fixed current shunt resistors and 5 milliamps is just outside of the full scale range yep. of the thing. So you can't do it. You've got to go up another range. So you're three orders of magnitude out, you know, like you've got three orders of magnitude less resolution at the higher range, you know. So you either have to design it specific for a use case and tailor your current shunt resistor and your amplifiers and everything else to be just for that application. Or when you've got a generic application like this, trying to design a generic measurement product, it's tough really tough <laughs> yeah. um it's, so it, so it, william it, what is what is your i mean so what do you want this thing to be the, the from the product side what do you want the product to be at the end i don't know it's kind of it keeps growing and growing so now i'm working on you remember the version with the color oled um uh-huh. i'm actually i mean monochrome oled now i'm working on an lcd version with color display and all that and i'm trying to do super fast measurements so i can catch every little peak and just kind of like a all-in-one right. device. I guess maybe I'm, I'm trying to put too much into one device I because mean, I've started to create various connectors instead of just USB. So it's turned into, you know, you can swap the bottom <laughs> out and do screw terminals. You can swap it out yeah. and do... I just did a, a USB 3.1 this last week. I did a DC jack one. And then last night I finished my Type-C connector one, which was a real mess, but that's another oh, story. Oh, yeah. Right, because then so, that goes yeah. up to 5 amps max, right, and 20 volts. Right. So. Well, that, and there's 24 connectors and the size of a small yeah. connector, so you're, right. you don't Those have a lot of Those are super PC tiny pitch. I, yeah. I've I, been using more USB-C stuff, and I think, I mean, aside from, like, I, I think about the actual, if you look at the control chips, like TI makes a new control chip for it, and it's, like, a nightmare right. to deal with on the electronics side, but the actual, like, use experience of USB-C is so awesome it is the future it is what i've always wanted you know it just works it's great yeah, i still got to order a usb device a usb c device i have nothing to test with so i found a pci yeah. express card that can add type c to your computer so at least i'll have something to test with i just actually got a uh, a, a battery like a portable ten thousand a million power battery that has it on it and it was like 25 bucks so that might be cheap too oh that's a better idea that's actually cheaper yeah because yeah, yeah. um uh, the, the hard thing was with creating it was to do a pass through. And then I learned that mm-hmm. USB three and C swap the transmit and receive inside the cable. Yeah. So uh, in the cable or in the, that's... in the control chip? No, in the cable. So it threw me for a huge loop because I had to reset the port again. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. So I have to swap the pairs again on the board so that on the second cable it gets swapped again. Well, so... I always break them out to test pad so that i can swap them and solder <laughs> well, that's the problem with, with usb3 if you, i cannot get a usb3 link to establish if i have any breakouts at all i can't have any branching it will not it refuses to negotiate wow. because of the so, speed you're saying or what yeah i can't get the five gig connection unless unless it's a perfectly <laughs> straight line no branching no stubs it has to be pristine wow yeah yeah that's, i mean all that's fun did was cut, i cut some traces to to cut off the breakout and it worked perfectly. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so among all that and trying to do low current measurement, it's, it's becoming quite a project. It's really pushing my limits cause I'm self-taught. So it's really pushing myself. All right. Well, so who, I mean, so who are you selling these things to? That's the real question of like, it sounds like you're kind of taking every suggestion and just kind of going with it. And that usually isn't the right choice. You know, you gotta yep. pick, no, you have, pick have to one focus. to start. Yeah, you have to focus. Well, right now, um, the base, just the USB breakout Adafruit cells, 
Um, the entire bundle with the OLED backpack is sold by the Hackaday store, Seed Studio, and myself, um, mm -hmm. Tindy, and my own store. So, but now I'm kind of wanted to improve that because right now I'm using the Atmega 32U4 and I'm like completely out of flash space, can't add any more features. The display is, I've outgrown the display, so I'm kind of take it to the next step. So, uh, well, I would, I, you know, the, the answer is usually to talk to your customers too, because the ones that like it, the ones that are going to actually buy the next one, I mean, that's what you really have to care about. So if they actually care about the screen, go with the screen. If they actually care about the, you know, the low range and having switching, go with that. I mean, that yep. sounds like a really no, uh, Focus stodgy, on, you know, yeah. do one thing and do it well. You mm -hmm. know, don't try and make this a jack of all trades because um, it usually does not work out well. <laughs> is this is this your is this your job? Oh, I wish. No, it's something I do at home. My wife helps, and uh, it's pretty much mm -hmm. you know my day job is IT doing DBA stuff. So I would love for this to be full time or anything electronic related to be full time, but it's not. So I mean, hopefully, I can grow it into something like that. Mm -hmm. But we'll mm -hmm. see. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's only so many hours in a day. So I did, like Dave yep. said, I mean, we were talking to a, someone earlier in the show too about you know like. Something that you want is maybe the best way to go for you know go forward, right? So what do you want in a in a device like this, especially because mm -hmm. you're not going to be doing you know you're not you're not the USB measuring Maven Maven yet, but you know you might be someday. And I think that Dave's spot on with doing something that you want, especially because you're going to be stuck with it either way, you know. Yeah, I'm, I mean I've learned a lot about USB in general just going down this path more than I've ever mm -hmm. thought I'd ever know about USB. So. Yeah, it's been a good oh, experience, yeah. one way or another. Well, well thanks for calling in. Uh, we will thanks, uh, we'll definitely link over to that thing too because it's uh, it, it's a fry, is it fried circuits? Is that right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, that's what yeah, is your... fried circuits is the name, the name we circuits. came up with. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You think uh, like you know that uh, that doesn't really inspire confidence, William? I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was inspired. Plug this in a like USB it. port. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was inspired by SparkFun, and then trying to come up with a short name and something that was I thought you know. You kind of learn when you yep. fry a circuit, so I kind of went with that, you know. We are actually gotcha. sitting at a Burger King when I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's Love awesome. It. Well, it was good talking right. to you. Thanks, mate. All right, you too. Bye. See ya. All right. Well, there you go. That's a wrap. That is a wrap. Just making sure there's nothing else in the chat. I don't think there is. All right, we're done. Thank you very much to everyone who called in. Yeah, definitely. We'll, uh, we'll probably be doing another one early May, you think? Yeah. Early May. Yep. May so, is... Oh, okay. No, it's build, April tomorrow. Build your questions up for then. Uh, I'll be gone most of April. Then yep. we'll probably have to do a catch-up episode. And, uh, yep. and then we'll do a call-in. Hey, we should take a holiday. Oh, yeah, I should tell you. I'm Yeah, I think I'm going on some sort of holiday soon. I, I just know. always assume you do. Yeah, you are. Yeah, so. right. Yep. Aussies are always <laughs> ready to set, step out the door and just... That's oh, it. Oh, yeah, by the way, I'll be back, maybe. <laughs> 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 cool. What else is going on with you? Real quick. Come on, real quick, Dave, update. What's going on with you? Um, I am, am super duper busy. I'm looking to actually hire another person to uh, do my packing and shipping. Cool. Nice. Good. So, yep. Um, and, yeah, it's all happening. I'm trying to get my... I have not gotten off my button, finished my uh, crowdfunding campaign for my new product. New thing, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, um, multimeter still the, selling, it's right? It's in here, ready to go. Yes, I've ordered a... Um, a Oh, a metric butt truck. Truck. <laughs> uh, yep, <laughs> a whole freighter full of those. Yeah, and, nice. Uh, yep, and so I got tons of back orders. Um, hundreds of back orders plus hundreds of people signed up to the email list who want one. So I'm looking at carrying another product shortly. Um, and yeah, it's all happening. It's all business, business, business at the moment. Yep. So yeah, if you've been wondering why the videos haven't been doing much lately and a lot of you know family stuff happening, family of so. course of course yep cool <sighs> all right man well i will uh, cool. update you once i'm back from europe we'll probably be i'll be getting some interviews from the road and uh Sweet. people have suggestions of people to talk to in europe that might not be able to talk because me and dave are usually on weird time zones i'd love to hear from you send me an email chris at the is always a good way to reach me cool cool man talk to you soon catch you next time <laughs>